So welcome everyone to the very first Georgia Climate Project webinar. My name is Rachel and I am here um, to welcome you and give you a little bit of background about the Georgia Climate Project before we go ahead and get started. I am a project manager working here in Atlanta. I'm actually from Savannah, so I'm so thrilled to be here today um, helping to organize this panel. I think it's going to be a really amazing event. So who are, who is the Georgia Climate Project? At our heart, we're a group of academic institutions from across the state. We were originally founded by Emory University, Georgia Tech, and University of Georgia, but since then we have grown to become a nonpartisan um, group of researchers that really present um, information on climate change, both impacts and solutions. We would also like to thank our many funders that make our work possible. Thank you so much. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without you. So at the Georgia Climate Project, we like to think of ourselves that we're, we do two different things. Um, first, we like to answer questions. And the next thing we like to do is help convene a network. So at the Georgia Climate Project, our two central questions are, what does a changing climate mean for Georgia? And what can we do about it? Um, and we use our network um, that is this amazing group of researchers, practitioners from across the state um, to help us uh, answer these questions. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight a few different projects that we have going on with the Georgia Climate Project that both help to answer these que questions and help to strengthen our network. So you're here today for the webinar. Um, this is not a one-time event. This is going to be happening every month. So I, we wanted to go ahead and give you sort of a save the date for upcoming topics on human health, ecosystems, and water resources that will be happening in the rest of 2020. And we really see this as a way to bring our experts to you at home on Zoom webinar um, and sort of really help us increase our network strategically across the state um, in many different areas of climate change impacts and solutions. So we're really excited today to announce the launch of another product called the Georgia Climate Information Portal. We really see this as going hand in hand with our webinars. Um, this is a part of our website where we really see it as a place to compile information about climate impacts um, in the state of Georgia. And the themes are directly aligned with the webinar themes. So I wanted to go ahead and show you what we have. Um, so if you navigate to our website, georgiaclimateproject.org, and you scroll down to this climate information portal section, um, you should be able to get some top messages on climate impacts in the state. Um, here in the coastal section, um, we're really proud to launch this today, um, has a lot of the topics that and discussion points we're going to be talking about with our panelists, um, in addition to some more detailed information and resources. So this is a living document we're going to, or living website rather, we're going to keep improving it and keep expanding it. So stay tuned every month, we're going to be releasing a new theme. Um, before I move on, huge thank you to everyone who made this website possible. Jill Gamble, Elizabeth Hunter, Ashby Worley, um, thank you for helping to write this. Also, Lauf Polipetti at Georgia Tech who helped to build this website section, thank you so much. Um, we hope this is as valuable to you as it is to us. Uh, next, you know, we the webinar and the information porter really are the science-based section of what does the change in climate mean for Georgia and what do we do about it? And we really see Georgia climate stories as the area where we get to say, what does a change in climate mean for people? What does it mean for Georgians? Um, so again, I wanted to just show you this really cool interface that we have on our website to explore some different um, stories of climate impacts and solutions in Georgia. So if you navigate to our website and go to the stories portal, we have this amazing um, sort of explore Georgia feature with all of these dots that are different stories throughout the state. And since today is Coastal Georgia Day, <laughs> you can do a subsection, you can organize it by theme or by region. So this is a really cool um, sort of flyby uh, feature where we can go ahead and zoom in on Highway 80 in Savannah and say, learn about this, um, it, you know, this project to uh, raise the Tybee Island Road or Highway 80 that floods frequently in Savannah. And if we advance it, it's kind of like this mini tour. We can hop on over to the backside of Tybee Island to go learn about a living shoreline. So 
again, I encourage you to go explore our website and there are more stories coming this fall, so please stay posted. Um, again, we're excited to highlight another um, exciting initiative. This is one that uh, we're proud to help support another group that's helping to organize Drawdown Georgia. Uh, this group is identifying the most important climate solutions in the state of Georgia. This has been a huge research initiative led by Mar Dr. Marilyn Brown at Georgia Tech, um, but with partners, research partners from across our state and across our academic partners list and they're getting ready to release um, the results from this massive project. So we wanted to flag that October 17th through 23rd is Drawdown Georgia Week. And there's a beautiful new website that has been launched with all kinds of wonderful information. So if you go to drawdownga.org, you can register for virtual events and just see the results that are coming soon. So very, very exciting. Lastly, uh, we are on social media. Please follow us and you won't miss any updates from us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, one quick note about the Zoom webinar platform. I'm sure all of you are Zoom experts at this point, but the webinar setting is a little bit different. On the bottom, both the chat and the Q&A are what we really encourage you as participants to use. Your camera and your audio are going to be off for the um, duration of the webinar. Feel free to introduce yourself on chat and feel free to ask questions of our panelists in the Q&A section. We are um, going to be sending out an evaluation link after the end of this webinar. Please let us know how we did, what we can improve. This is a monthly series, as I mentioned earlier, and we really do want to make it useful for everyone who attends. So please let us know what you think. And uh, before we uh, get to our amazing panelists to help us answer what does a changing climate mean for Georgia's coast, I just wanna thank everyone that made today possible. This has been a wonderful team effort um, led by Jill Gamble at University of Georgia, who's here with us today. In addition to Swati Upadhyay, thank you so much for helping to organize this, as well as Brandon Ellis at um, Rollins School of Public Health IT to help us with the Zoom webinar. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your help. All right, and to get things started, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful moderator for today, who is Ashby Worley. Ashby Nix Worley joined the Nature Conservancy as their Coastal Resilience Manager in November 2016, where she works with coastal partners and communities to bring nature-based solutions to help address coastal hazards in order to build a more resilient coastal Georgia. Ashby has an undergraduate degree in environmental science from Mercer University and master's of science degree in environmental science, specializing in wetland studies from Louisiana State University. Ashby has worked as a coastal scientist in coastal Georgia region for over 10 years, working with the Department of Natural Resources and the University of Georgia in conducting long-term ecological monitoring, oyster restoration, water quality, and marsh studies. From 2013 to 2016, she served as the executive director of the nonprofit organization Satilla Riverkeeper, where she worked with local communities on environmental outreach, education, awareness, advocacy, and policy. Ashby currently serves as the chair of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Coastal Advisory Council and board member for Coastal Wildscapes, a local nonprofit promoting native coastal habitats. Ashby is a certified flood plan manager since November 2017. All right, now I'm happy to turn the floor over to Ashby. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, and good morning, everyone. Today's presenters will be discussing various aspects of the climate Im impacts along our coast, from the expected impacts of sea level rise and its effects on our coastal ecosystems and infrastructure, all the way to how climate is impacting our coastal communities and what actions and solutions are being taken to adapt to the climate change. So without further ado, let's jump into the program and hear from our great speakers. To kick us off, we have Ms. Jill Gamble with an introduction on sea level rise in Georgia. Jill Gamble is Public Service Faculty and Coastal Resilience Specialist for the University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. Jill is an affiliate faculty with the UGA Institute for Resilient Infrastructure Systems, UGA Institute for Women's Studies, and Georgia Initiative for Climate and Society. Gamble is author, author, a co-author of Georgia's first and second municipal sea level rise plans, which were featured in the fourth National Climate Assessment. She is co-chair of the Georgia Coastal Hazards Community Practice and a core coordinator of the Georgia Climate Project. 
In addition to faculty work, Gamble is a PhD student in geography and integrative conservation at UGA and holds a master's in peace and conflict studies from the University of Sydney, Australia, and a bachelor's in philosophy from Cardiff, Wales, and is a graduate of the Institute for Georgia Environmental Leaders. So Jill, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Ashby. Let's see. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to give a quick primer on um, climate change in coastal Georgia to get us all on the same page today. Um, so let's start with what has happened in the recent past. Um, the southeastern United States sustains more billion dollar weather and climate disasters than any other region of the country. Over the past 40 years, this risk in Georgia has been increasing. Our coastal communities in Georgia are facing multiple climate related hazards from an increase in intensive rainfall events, severe heat waves and decreased water availability. However, today we are going to focus mostly on one particular hazard, sea level rise. We have a long term NOAA tide gauge um, in Savannah at Fort Pulaski National Monument that has been measuring water levels since 1935. Over those 85 years, it has observed over 10 inches of sea level rise. While that may not sound like much, especially considering the dynamic nature of our tidal range here in Georgia, this has led to sharp increases in flooding along the Georgia coast. In 1950, the Georgia coast would flood approximately every one to three years. In 2019, the Savannah area flooded 42 times using that same flood threshold many days just during a sunny day high tide. However, flooding is not just happening more frequently. It is also becoming more severe. Five of the top 10 highest water levels measured at the Fort Pulaski tide gauge have occurred since, or, sorry, since 2015. This also means that when a tropical storm or hurricane like Hurricane Irma or Hurricane Matthew threatens the Georgia coast, storm surge launches from a higher starting point than in the past. These flood events translate into real financial impacts for Georgia businesses and homeowners. FEMA estimates that just one inch of water can cause $25,000 worth of damage to a property. Looking to the future, rising global temperatures are melting land ice and causing the thermal expansion of water. This means that as water heats up, it expands, taking up more space. The combination of these factors is resulting in acceleration of sea level rise. Here in coastal Georgia, predictions of regional sea level rise are up to 31% higher than the global average for 2100. There are many uncertainties in projecting future water levels. So to help government plan, DNR recommends considering the intermediate and intermediate high scenarios of four to 6.3 feet of sea level rise by 2100. This could translate into 194 to 365 days of flooding at high tide per year by 2100. Today, we're going to further explore how these impacts are playing out in our ecosystems and our communities as well as learn about the hard work that many people in coastal Georgia are already doing to prepare, adapt, and recover from a changing climate on our coast. And with that, I will hand it back over to Ashby. Great, thanks so much, Jill. Next, we have Dr. Joel Koska presenting on the impacts of climate change on coastal ecosystems and marshes. Joel Koska is a professor and associate chair for research in the schools of biological sciences and earth and atmospheric sciences at the Georgia Institute for Technology. Joel has a bachelor's in biology from Western Illinois University, a master's in marine biology from the College of Charleston and PhD in marine sciences from the University of Delaware. Joel was an NSF postdoc fellow at the University of Wisconsin and a visiting scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Bremen, Germany. His research group specializes in characterizing the role of micro microorganisms in ecosystem functioning, especially in the context of bioremediation and climate change. Joel has published over 110 ref refereed journal publications and achieved an H index of 56 with over 10,000 citations. 
He has served as a co-PI for the Sea Image and Deep Sea Consortia, both funded at 20 million by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. In 2011, Joel co-authored a report from the American Academy of Microbiology entitled Microbes and Oil Spills, Frequently Asked Questions. Joel served as an editor of the Journal of Applied and Environmental Microbiology. And currently, Joel, Dr. Koska serves as a distinguished lecturer for the American Society for Microbiology, as well as chair-elect for the Gordon Research Conference in Applied and Environmental Microbiology. Dr. Koska is also a member of the American Academy of Microbiology. So Dr. Koska, you can take it from here. Okay, so I'll just ask Ashby once I share my screen to tell me if it looks good. Um, so I want to do PowerPoint. Okay, how's that look? Yep, that looks great. Okay, I want to thank uh, Jill and uh, Ashby and uh, the Georgia Climate Project for organizing this webinar and giving me a chance to talk to you. And I also want to thank Georgia Sea Grant for funding my research on coastal ecosystems. So what I want to do is I want to talk about coastal ecosystems and also salt marshes as guardians or protectors of, of the coastline. And so over the next few minutes, I'll talk about the value of these coastal ecosystems. I'll talk about their resilience in the face of, of climate change. Uh, what are some threats to these uh, coastal ecosystems and what what can we do about them, as is the, the Georgia Climate Project motto. All right, first of all, we're, we're lucky to have uh, a lot of coastal ecosystem in Georgia. That's the 14 barrier islands, often called the jewels of the Georgia coast, and a lot of, of healthy salt marsh. So something like 400,000 acres of salt marsh are on the Georgia coast, and this makes up about one third of the salt marsh that's present on the entire eastern uh, coast of the United States. So we have a lot of that salt marsh in the east coast of the United States here in Georgia. This is a picture uh, of a, a salt marsh on Sapelo Island near the lighthouse, as you can see. Okay, so how do marshes benefit people? Well, I, I think if you're tuning in, you probably know this already, but one of the important services that salt marshes provide is a habitat or a nursery for for fish and shellfish that we like to catch and eat on the coast. So uh, a lot of fish and shellfish species spend a good bit of their lifetime in the salt marsh, especially when they're young, there's plenty of food to eat and they can hide from predators and get bigger uh, in the marsh. What might be a little bit less obvious to you is that salt, marsh per, salt marshes provide a, a physical barrier or protection from catastrophic catastrophic storms such as hurricanes. As you can see in this photo, uh, marshes act to absorb or dampen storm energy uh, from storm surge as it, as it approaches the coastline. I also like to call salt marshes the kidneys of the coast because they act to filter uh, pollution, especially nutrient pollution, uh, as waters move uh, off the land surface or run off the land surface into the coastal ocean. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit here and now talk more specifically about climate change. So you can, you can define resilience as the capacity to respond to or recover from disruption or a disturbance, such as that that, that happens from a, a big storm or climate change or sea level rise. Oops, let's see. Okay, my computer was thinking for a little bit there. Um, and coastal wetlands, uh, salt marshes in particular, provide that capacity for resilience on the coast. Um, these marshes, also called natural or nature-based features or natural infrastructure, provide the first line of defense. As I said, attack communities from, from, from flooding and storm surge. Here you see the Altamaha River estuary in the upper left-hand corner here. Um, and in addition to that, uh, in, in comparison to say armored structures like concrete barriers, marshes and shorelines are obviously living, living habitats. And so they're able to migrate or retreat with sea level rise. So they'll move 
inland with sea level rise, uh, unlike con concrete structures, which we'd have to break down and then build again as, as sea level rises. Okay, so uh, I was also asked to, to talk about what are some threats to uh, coastal ecosystems. And, and really it's multiple stressors, unfortunately, lately. Um, one of the main ones is, is simply development of properties and habitat loss. That is uh, filling in of marshes uh, for construction activities on the coast is a major stressor. Uh, hardened shorelines, as I just talked about, so uh, making uh, seawalls and concrete barriers, for example, disrupts the normal exchange of water and sediments on the coastline, and this is a threat to salt marshes. Pollution has been, shown, been linked to the, the productivity of marshes, uh, the productivity of vegetation. Um, dams, for example, when we prevent, uh, uh, so salt marshes um, grow on the coastline partially uh, when sediment accumulates on the coast, and that sediment comes from rivers. And so by damming rivers, we prevent uh, a source of sediments to, to feed uh, salt marshes. And, and more particularly uh, for climate change and sea level rise, uh, some of the major threats to these salt marshes are simply a lack of space for the marsh to migrate inland. If you build homes right on the, on the marsh, uh, there's no space for the marsh to move. Um, an inability of, of, of the marsh elevation to keep up with sea level rise. Again, a lack of sediment supply will cause that. And also the erosion, uh, erosion of the marsh edge. Due to all these multiple stressors, marshes sometimes can't keep up and, and erode. Okay, and so I just wanted to give you some examples of some threatened or vulnerable marshes. Often these occur in urbanized areas. So over 80% of tidal wetlands on the East Coast of the United States have, have been lost uh, in urban areas and rising sea level exacerbates this uh, this loss in, in shoreline erosion. So here you see uh, an urban salt marsh and, and where the edge has been eroded on the left-hand picture here. And on the right-hand uh, panel, you see a salt marsh that's not able to keep up with sea level rise. So it's drowning uh, as water inundates. And then at the extreme, you see uh, a marsh that looks like this. This is a dieback area where you see all the vegetation has, has died in this particular uh, urban salt marsh. Okay, so we, we know what these problems are. So why do these threats persist? Well, for I think a lot of people take coastal resources for granted. There's a, a lack of awareness. Uh, folks think that climate change uh, might not impact them. Um, and we also have a lack of data, just getting the word out of the importance of these ecosystems and and uh, and that they are important for resilience to climate change. So a lack of expertise or technical help, a lack of funding to get these initiatives off the ground, and a lack of data to know where uh, vulnerable coastal ecosystems are that we need, where we need to take action. And I like to give this as an example uh, that you, this boils down to, we need to convince Taylor Swift uh, to take into account the importance of coastal ecosystems. Uh, this is, I got this idea from one of my social scientist uh, friends. So apparently there was a lot of controversy when uh, Taylor Swift built an armored shoreline in front of her beach house in Rhode Island. Uh, and as you can see, this is a great example uh, of, of what I've been talking about. So uh, here you see a lot of rock uh, that was placed uh, along the, the, in front of the house and a, a armored shoreline, a, a concrete barrier that was built. And so you can see uh, it's really hard for coastal ecosystems to grow in this area uh, uh, when, you, when you build such a structure. And such a structure will not move with sea level rise and that it will eventually uh, be covered over with water as sea level uh, increases. Uh, so this is a good example of, of, of increasing awareness. We need to convince people like Taylor Swift to uh, use living shorelines or take into account natural infrastructure rather than building these armored structures. So, okay, yeah. We've got about 30 seconds left. Okay, sorry. All right, so what can we do about it? So the, here are some what I would call adaptive management strategies. So uh, one of them is just assessing uh, vulnerable coastal ecosystems. Uh, there are various strategies for stabilizing the shoreline. One is increasing marsh elevation. 
uh, through a process called beneficial use, where basically we can take dredge sediments adjacent to the marsh and put them on the marsh to increase elevation, simply allowing space for the marsh to migrate or retreat. Uh, land conservation is a big part of that, getting people to set aside their land for retreat. Um, uh, and also planting grasses and other living shorelines like oyster reefs. So I'll just go quickly through it. This is a, a pilot project that's going on in Georgia right now near Jekyll Island uh, that's led by the, the Georgia DNR, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, where they're trying out in, in a lower elevation marsh area how this uh, beneficial use of dredge sediment might work to increase marsh elevation uh, as one adaptive active action strategy. And I'll end there. Great. Thanks, Dr. Koska. Um, I encourage the participants to chime in to the Q&A box with any questions they have for Dr. Koska. And uh, we already have one question um, that popped up, which is, what can be done to protect the salt marshes in the short term besides policy changes to prevent development? Well, um, one thing is, is uh, as I've been talking about here, is, is to put the word to the streets, is let people know about the importance of natural infrastructure and, and living shoreline barriers. That is so people will, uh, will uh, uh, if, if you're a homeowner, uh, for example, on the coastline, so you'll choose uh, natural infrastructure uh, to protect your, your beach house or your home instead of building an armored shoreline. Uh, and choose a, against uh, building a concrete barrier. So uh, simply uh, 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 getting the word out uh, of the importance of these coastal ecosystems and giving people tools uh, rather than building, for example, armored shorelines to protect their homes. That's one strategy that we can do right now. Great, thank you. Um, one other question is, what can local governments or homeowners be doing to protect the marsh against sea level rise? Well, in anticipation of your uh, question, I have another slide here. Uh, let's see. What can we do? So here, I, I, this is from a fact sheet that I made up a long time ago on what can people do to protect salt marshes. And the first thing is uh, salt marshes or local governments simply learn more about them. And we have a National Estuarine Research Reserve here in Georgia on Sapelo Island. That's one place to contact. Um, you can, as a, as, a, as a citizen, volunteer for community projects such as cleanup efforts. As I said, pollution stresses the marsh. So helping to clean up pollution is one way to help. Um, and then just being, if you're a homeowner on the coastline, just being smart about how you use chemicals like fertilizers and pesticides, which act as stressors for coastal ecosystems. Um, using chemicals responsibly, uh, recycling at home and at work. If you have a septic system, keep it in good working order because that, that uh, is a source of pollution on the coastline. And then if you have a boat, to use a marine sanitation device or a pump out station. So these are, these are what individuals can do. And as far as local government goes, I think it's incorporating these ideas that I've been talking about into their planning and working with partners like the universities, like nonprofits that Ashby represents, like uh, federal partners to plan better for these, for coastal hazards uh, and to identify vulnerable ecosystems uh, and use some of these strategies that I talked about. Right. We do have a few more questions coming in and maybe about one minute left to answer. So I'll throw out one more um, of these. So thanks for y'all submitting them. Is there any consideration for the CH4 methane emissions from marshlands? And is that something that should be considered? Yeah, there's there's some federal studies going on about methane emission from marshes. My uh, so I actually work on freshwater wetlands as, as well, which uh, and freshwater wetlands are a, a, a huge source of methane on a global scale. So so uh, my answer to that question is that marshes are really important for what for carbon sequestration and what we call blue carbon um, and less important as a source of, of methane. So they, they produce greenhouse gases uh, like carbon dioxide, but they're less of an important source for methane. Thanks, Dr. Koska. Um, keep those questions coming in and we will save those for the end of the session, um, which we've blocked out some time to, to dig into these a little bit further. So 
Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next speaker. And thanks, Dr. Koska. Great presentation. Next up, we have Mr. Scott Pippin discussing the impacts of climate change on our coastal infrastructure. Scott is an attorney and community planner who joined the Institute of Government's Planning and Environmental Services Unit in 2014. He works on issues concerning environmental and natural resource planning, climate resilience, nature-based and green infrastructure practices, land use, community planning, and economic development, and updating and revising city and county land use ordinances. In addition to planning and technical assistance, Scott works directly with communities to develop funding and implement projects that provide social and economic and environmental benefits. He also delivers training courses on a variety, wide variety of subjects, such as stormwater management, planning and zoning, planning and zoning practices, community resilience and sustainability, and preparing for large scale solar installation. Prior to joining the Institute of Government, he worked as a local government attorney and environmental consultant. So Scott, okay. we'll hear from um, you. Thank you, Ashby. Um, and as I try to make sure I share my screen properly, tell me if this looks like it's supposed to. Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Ashby for that introduction and thank Jill and the Georgia Climate Project for um, inviting me here to speak to y'all. And I also wanna thank all of y'all on this webinar for um, taking the time to learn more about the impacts of climate change on Georgia and Georgia's coast. Um, as Ashby said, I'm a in the public service faculty at the Carl Vincent Institute of Government. So I spent the last several years working with local governments on our coast, as well as state and federal agencies, talk about challenges uh, to adapting to climate change, particularly sea level rise. Um, and the, the thing to keep in mind about local government infrastructure and the impacts of sea level rise is unlike a lot of other um, challenges to infrastructure, particularly things like natural disasters and hurricanes, um, sea level rise is what we call a slowly unfolding disaster, meaning that um, we're experiencing some impacts today, but we're going to see those impacts not only increase, but increase exponentially over time. Um, so while today we're talking about things like stormwater, drainage issues, and road flooding, and some um, relatively kind of nuisance issues, these are really just a harbinger for much more severe impacts to come when we're talking about impacts to wastewater treatment plants and electrical grids and sort of the more fundamental parts of, well, I mean, they're all fundamental parts of our infrastructure, but what we do and the decisions we make about how we deal with these impacts today are gonna to shape how we are able to deal with much more severe impacts to come. So to illustrate this, I'm gonna talk about a couple of different infrastructure systems um, that are currently experiencing um, severe sea level rise impacts and are um, eventually gonna be critical to the survival of, um, of coastal communities and the ability uh, of residents to remain on the coast. And those are our road network, our wastewater infrastructure, and then I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about some of the things that are being done and things that are being promoted to create a more adaptive future in addressing those challenges and then our future challenges. So the roads are sort of the, the front line of, of infrastructure impacts. Um, in addition to being um, the most visible and the most um, used infrastructure that most coastal residents are aware of, um, they're also uh, extremely vulnerable to storm damages. Um, but as we um, prepare and go through the hazard um, planning exercise that Jennifer is going to talk about in a little bit, um, we are becoming increasingly prepared to deal with the threats from major storms and communities can um, build back and recover after those types of events. However, what is more challenging are the nuisance flooding events um, that Jill was alluding to. These are the, um, the regular occurring sunny day flooding, tidal flooding events that inundate our roads. These are pictures from Tybee Island a few years ago, um, but this happens all the time. As, as Jill said, it happened 43 times last year and is going to continue to happen on increasing frequency. Um, and these flooding events uh, do undermine the structural integrity of roads. They um, prevent access to other infrastructure elements. They um, prevent people from accessing their homes or leaving their homes. Um, and really, in, when you think about the existential threats to coastal communities, it is this type of flooding 
that really poses the greatest threat, you know, because as I said, um, in, in recovering from storms, the communities usually pull together. There's a, an outpouring of resources from the federal level from other communities to help communities get back on their feet and recover from those um, sort of sudden shocks and those severe impacts. But these gradually um, inundating uh, flooding events, like these are the things that are going to eventually cause people to uh, give up on living on the coast and move away and close businesses and create uh, the declining tax base that threatened really the survival of many of these communities. So this is sort of the big challenge that we need to think about. Um, and so this graph is an extrapolation of, um, of the sea level rise curves that Jill was showing. And it shows what ties that sea level rise curve to the flooding threshold at Fort Pulaski and shows you the, the, the increased frequency of these flooding events. As you see 50 years ago, it was an extremely rare event. It happened every few years that you would have one of these um, nuisance flooding events. And now they happen with um, some regularity. And especially with these, um, even the intermediate projections in 20, 40 years, it'll be a weekly or biweekly occurrence and just be a standard part of life for many of these communities. And so this is a map we developed in a project we were doing with the city of Beaufort. Um, the, you see the, the map on the left shows the road network for both the city and the county. Um, and the map on the right shows you the road sections that were inundated under three feet of sea level rise. These are the, the road sections that will be inundated on a daily basis with three feet of sea level rise. So you see that the transportation network is largely unusable in, in parts of the community. And so how this is going to impact all of the other functions of the city and the county and where people live and where people can work. It's one of the fundamental issues that they're going to have to tackle is how people are going to move around and be connected in the future because of these impacts to their roads. And the other issue to think about when you're talking about roads is it's not really just one system. You know, when you're driving around, you get off one road, you turn, um, you get on the interstate, you get off the highway. But really, the, the roads are um, an integrated system of different systems. You know, the city owns roads, the county owns roads, the state owns roads, and the federal government owns roads. And they all have different um, maintenance standards and obligations and priorities in how they build um, and manage those roads. And so adapting to these challenges requires the integrated um, planning and consideration of all of those entities. In addition, um, it, it varies by state. Um, each state has different laws about how the community um, has to maintain their roads, what sort of liabilities they have if they fail to maintain their roads, what happens if they try to abandon roads, is, um, are there are property rights issues to consider, and then the economic impacts and the social and equity impacts of adjusting these, um, this transportation network and who feels the impacts and who pays for the adjustments are all things that have to be thought through as we consider you know, how to you know, build roads and maintain roads in the future in the face of these threats. And so shifting gears a little bit, the other uh, big element to think about for coastal infrastructure is that all the impacts of sea level rise aren't on the surface. As sea level rise, um, it is sea, as sea levels rise, the impacts are also gonna be felt on inland areas um, by the impacts to the groundwater table as higher tides basically mean that less water is able to move out to the sea from the groundwater and so that water all backs up leading to wetter soils and a higher groundwater table in inland areas. And an example of the impacts of this is in our wastewater infrastructure. Um, I know a lot of people uh, think of septic systems as sort of antiquated um, infrastructure and not necessarily part of um, the modern world, but it still forms, about a quarter of American homes are still served by septic systems. And in many coastal areas, it's well over half. And actually the majority of new development in coastal areas is, um, is served by septic systems. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, a septic system depends on a certain separation between that system and the groundwater to adequately treat the uh, waste effluent that, is, um, that it's filtering. And as that sea, as sea levels rise and that groundwater table increases, that a lot of that um, treatment area is going to be lost. 
And you know that's not going to necessarily affect all the systems, and some will continue to function. But a, a number of systems, arguably most systems, are going to be impacted in one of two ways: either they'll be what we're calling compromised, in the sense that the, that treatment area is lost, and not as much uh, of the bacteria and the nutrients are able to be filtered out of that effluent before it reaches the groundwater, and then is transmitted to our streams and marshes or the system is going to be completely inundated, leading to a structural failure where that effluent is basically not treated at all and it backs up into the home or pools in, in a yard or in some other space where people are directly exposed to it, which can, both of which can cause um, dramatic uh, public health and environmental health issues. Um, You've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. So real quick uh, to just a, uh, talk about the scale of those impacts. We did a study in Bryan County looking at how septic systems function under rising sea level uh, conditions and basically found that a lot of the well-functioning sites in the low and moderate um, risk categories are going to move to a very risky category where they are expected to have some sort of problems um, um, under different sea level rise conditions. And then Sewer lines also have their own issues. Um, whenever I talk about septic systems and, and flooding, people are like, well, what, what is it gonna cost to run sewer lines to all these areas? But sewers have their own vulnerabilities. They are also vulnerable to the, a lot of the same groundwater challenges um, and then the treatment issues um, of flooding and, uh, and the impact of the groundwater on treatment plants are similar problems. Um, but I also just wanna bring up that some more hopeful ideas of reducing vulnerability um, by the use of green infrastructure. By green infrastructure, as Joel talked about, um, I mean the incorporation of natural systems and things like wetlands and wetland restoration into our infrastructure planning and understanding how both the protection and restoration and then the artificial creation of some of these features can build resilience into these infrastructure systems and need to be part of our basic in conception of what infrastructure is and how we plan and design for it. Um, and to that end, I'll also take a moment to just plug a, a green infrastructure guide, um, a guide for coastal resilience based on um, green infrastructure that we worked on with our partners at the Coastal Resources Division, Jennifer Klein and Kelly Hill, um, that talk about how communities can use a lot of these tools and the value of using these tools in their future infrastructure planning. So with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Or... Great, yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, we do have a question that came up in the chat um, from Phil Odom that says, as sea level rises, will this influence the issue of saltwater intrusion in our coastal aquifers? Um, absolutely, um, yeah, could have done the whole presentation about the impacts on, on drinking water and, uh, and water service and, and yes, uh, the. Basically, as the sea levels rise, that and it, it's that saltwater lens of higher tide levels that is pushing that freshwater groundwater up. But it also makes deeper wells much more um, susceptible to pumping salt water. It exposes a lot of bed and ground infrastructure to increase corrosion risk because of this increased salinity of the water. And so, yeah, it's it's a huge component of this risk. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, another question here is. What do you think will be the biggest challenge to local governments in the next 10 years in regard to coastal infrastructure and climate change? Um, so I, financing a lot of the, the needed improvements um, and where is the money going to come from to pay for improvements that they need to the road network, to their wastewater treatment plant, to their drinking water wells, um, particularly that if they don't begin these adaptations in um, in a timely manner in, in time to really preserve the economic vitality that, that, that is their tax base, that, that, get, that finances their improvements, they're gonna find themselves in a, in a sort of a spiral of reducing revenues at, at the same time they have increasing costs to maintain basic infrastructure systems. So how are they gonna plan for the future both in terms of financial stability, um, financial resilience and infrastructure resilience at the same time? Right. Thanks, Scott. This has been excellent. I appreciate it. All right, uh, moving along to the next presenter for today, we have Mr. Dawood Shabaka presenting on the impacts of climate change on coastal communities. Born and raised in New Haven, Connecticut, Dawood graduated from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, 
with a bachelor's in psychology and started a 30 year career in IT specializing in network administration of Microsoft server technologies. The proud father of three amazing young adults, Dawood lived in Atlanta for 30 years and the United Kingdom for five years before moving to Savannah, Georgia four years ago. Having volunteered and contracted with the Harrenby House and Citizens for Environmental Justice since its founding in 1990, Dawood joined their staff in 2017. Dawood is, Dawood is Associate Director for Training and Outreach for their Environmental Careers Worker Training Program, Hazardous Waste Workers Training Program, Environmental Health and Safety Training Program, and the Black Youth Leadership Development Institute, Community Emergency Response Team, and various projects and initiatives focused on community-based environmental justice, health, and social and racial and economic, economic inequities. Dawood holds certifications and has has Whopper 40, Asbestos and Lead Awareness, Hazardous Communications and GHS, OSHA 10, Construction, Weatherization, Emergency Response and Disaster Preparedness, as well as Infectious Disease Awareness and Prevention. So Mr. Shabaka, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, let me check and make sure I share my screen correctly. How was that? Yeah, that looks great. That would be great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Gamble and the Georgia Cli Climate Project for inviting me to speak today. I wish to speak briefly about the effects of climate change and global warming on our frontline and fence line communities. <laughs> The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There you go. Uh, predicts a possible rise of up to two degrees Celsius in the global atmospheric temperature by the year 2100. NASA reports that 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since the year 2001, and the five hottest years have been the last five years. As the global heat increases, we have been experiencing more intense weather events, and forecasts indicate the possibility of up to 24 named storms this year, including possibly 12 of those being hurricanes, and five of those major hurricanes. Just recently, Hurricane Laura, uh, Laura was described as one of the most intense hurricanes to make landfall in the US and produce tornadoes and intense heavy rain as it traveled across the South. And along with intense storm activity, another danger of climate change is the spread of infectious disease. Current climate change conditions create a breeding ground in the southern states of America for a species of mosquitoes not previously prevalent here. So now we have conditions existing for diseases such as dengue fever, Zika fever, and yellow fever that can spread specifically around the west, uh, the, around the south of, of this country. In the midst of all this, we are victims of the worst pandemic in 100 years. And along with its deadly impact, COVID-19 has showed us an underlying and ever-present reality. We live in a world and under a governmental system where particular communities are ignored and overlooked through systemic racism, redlining, and public policy that has devised a priority for a single social group has created dire living conditions for Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color. 
Black people, indigenous people, and people of color are more likely to live near ports, near Superfund sites, and near to and in the shadow of industrial factories. This happens to them much more often than to white communities. They are subjected to air, soil, and water pollution on a daily basis. Movement of goods to and from ports through by cargo carrying trucks, spew diesel fuels and emissions in those same communities. Once again, people of color living near ports, living near Superfund sites, and living near chemical companies experience the devastating impact of pollutants and chemical hazards at a higher level than the rest of us. These communities have higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, cancer, and asthma. In Savannah, the communities on the west side of the city sitting near the port and surrounded by 17 chemical companies that do business at the port have higher rates of these diseases than the rest of the city. With the impacts of more extreme weather events, these unhealthy medical conditions are exacerbated and add to the pain and the burden experienced by these communities. A look at the assets available in these communities reveals a lack of transportation and medical services. It is a greater burden to these communities to find, travel to, and receive medical service than other communities. And it is a greater burden for them to evacuate from these communities if a mandatory evacuation is called for. And they have minimal resources if they are required or if they decide to shelter in place to, to, to make that situation happen. All of this places them at a greater risk to injury, sickness, and death than other residents. This is a situation crying out for remediation, for improvement. For all coastal cities, because this is a pattern that exists across America, but certainly here in Savannah, a priority must be given to those communities in an effort to change these conditions. Installation of zero emission equipment and technology and converting diesel trucks to e electric vehicles must be placed on a fast track to lower the presence of diesel fumes and volatile organic compounds in their air. Public transportation must be redesigned to more accommodate people without personal transportation. Communities suffering from redlining and the lack of loans for home ownership must be infused with vital resources and funding through innovative approaches to financing. Medical services and home care options must be made available throughout these communities to improve the health and the lives of children, the elderly, and their family. Industry and the ports must be tasked with adhering to environmental laws and policies that are already on the books. Legislation just as, as such as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, 
and the National Environmental Policy Act must be fortified, not gutted. These laws are designed to keep us healthy and alive, and also to help improve our environment and maintain the sanctity of our ecology. Mr. Shabaka. These suggestions. Mr. Sh you have about 30 seconds left. Thank you, thank you. These suggestions are a beginning for examining the issues around what these communities face and how they can be resolved. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end and, uh, and take on any questions that may be available. Yeah, thank you, Jalud. Uh, we did have a, a question come into the chat um, that I wanna read to you uh, from Dan. It is regarding community involvement and helping to monitor sunny day flooding events in local areas what programs are available for citizens to participate in? Is there a Georgia King Tide project? He participates in the North Carolina King Tides project and would be interested in connecting with a Georgia King Tide group. I'm familiar with Chatham County project using the low cost water gauges to monitor real time water levels. Has the use of low cost water gauges been expanded along coastal Georgia? Uh, yes, they have. The, uh, the program I'm aware of is sponsored by the Georgia Institute of Technology, and they are creating an array of uh, sea level sensors uh, along the tributaries and the coast of Georgia. Uh, my understanding is that they have deployed around 50, 55 monitors right now. They intend to expand it to uh, uh, 80 or a little more. The, the system uses the internet and the internet of things. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Georgia Tech has been uh, community minded and are working and they are working with a couple of schools, couple of high schools and a middle school on the west side of Savannah so that the students there are getting the experience of building these monitors, working on the software, and of course, becoming engaged in the, uh, the science around building such an, an array. Uh, concerning the first part of your question, I am not familiar with that program in the area, uh, but I may, uh, uh, you know, I, I simply may not have that information. Uh, I can uh, look into that, but Georgia Tech would be a, uh, and, and of course the Georgia Climate Project would be uh, two groups that you could contact to, to get further information on, on, on that. Um, however, the, uh, the idea for a community-based uh, um, uh, flooding and tidal flooding uh, a project I think is a really good idea and it has and it would work to help inform communities of this issue and then also uh, uh, is a is a method of citizen science to help the community become aware of the issue and look to ways to mitigate the issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Uh, we have another question that came in from Karina. Um, is any work being done to make evacuating possible for people without resources to leave during natural disasters? Well, the Harambe House works with uh, the city of Savannah and uh, SEMA in looking at the, the vulnerabilities that are on the west side of, of the city and how they can be uh, addressed. Uh, we have working to compile a community profile for one community on the west side that will be expanded to others, as well as looking at um, emergency response planning for the, uh, the west side of the city. Now, this has been done previously, but um, it has to be updated and we are also looking at how to inform the west side communities of these activities and spreading the word. 
I, I, it, it's not for a lack of desire, but more for a, a lack of, of resources. And I, it seems to me this is being addressed um, uh, currently. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shabaka. Excellent presentation and, and thanks for answering those questions. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker, but please keep your questions coming in either for Mr. Shabaka or our um, previous speakers because we will have time at the end of this session to take a few more questions. So keep those uh, questions coming in in the Q&A box. Next, we have Ms. Jennifer Klein talking about solutions and community actions on climate change. Jennifer Klein is a coastal hazard specialist for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Coastal Resources Division, where she has worked for the past 14 years. Jennifer is a specialist for the Georgia Coastal Management Program, which represents the 11 coastal counties in Georgia. Mrs. Klein works closely with local governments in relaying information from federal and other state agencies regarding coastal hazards, planning, and climate change impacts. She is leading the state and coastal Georgia in disaster recovery and redevelopment planning, making Georgia the first state to have a completely resilient coast based on FEMA's natural disaster recovery framework, framework by the year 2020. Before joining the Coastal Resources Division, Mrs. Klein worked for the department's Environmental Protection Division as an industrial compliance specialist from 2001 to 2005. This provided the opportunity to oversee activities related to air quality, hazardous waste, solid waste, water quality, and water supply. With a combined total of over 18 years with the department, Jennifer has made it a priority to foster the mission and goals of DNR, as well as ensure that the public trust is a, is a consistent priority. Mrs. Klein graduated from Valdosta State University with degrees in environmental geography and geology. Jennifer, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Ashby. That looks good. Okay. Uh, let's see, let's get a full presentation here. Okay, well, thank you. Um, as you can tell, we have um, some serious um, issues that we are um, need to address and are addressing as it regards, um, in regards to climate change here in coastal Georgia. Um, with the, the previous presentations, I wanted to be able to be that follow-up um, end on a positive note and let you know that here in coastal Georgia, we're, we're not just sitting back and waiting for climate change to happen. Um, I don't know that we have a solution, but we are rather looking at um, adapting and mitigating um, and um, looking to those, step, those steps to be more resilient to the effects of climate change and sea level rise. And then where we can, um, helping to minimize some of those um, some of those impacts. And so I wanted to be able to go through um, some of those with you. Um, with our program um, at Coastal Resources Division of DNR, it is our um, one of our goals to provide technical assistance to our 11 coastal counties um, on Georgia's coast. Um, and that can be through, through, just through technical assistance, it can be through um, funding opportunities, it can be through giving um, transfer of science to management, and also fostering um, science and research. So um, as I was thinking through some of the questions that was posed before me before coming up with this project, um, I really was actually quite impressed myself when thinking about what our communities have been doing all six ocean facing counties have taken so, at some step at addressing sea level rise um, through many different um, mechanisms that we'll go through. But to have all six counties um, at least take some sort of step to recognize that as an issue um, and start some of the planning and adaptation steps is, is a huge um, accomplishment. I will say that our Coastal communities, um, our coastal resource managers and our partners, we've been working on climate change in coastal Georgia for over 10 years now. Um, a couple of the questions that were posed to me before getting started were what are some of our strengths in Georgia? And I will say that I feel like coastal Georgia has been 
dead fast and steady on continuing to move forward with planning for, whether that's doing research or it's doing some sort of local government implementation or communication, um, there has been nothing that has really slowed us down or hindered us or um, persuaded us to not continue to look at this. And so I know that many other of our neighboring states have had hiccups along the way and have had to kind of take a few steps back. And we've been fortunate that um, we have not had that. So we're, um, we've been able to continue to move forward. Um, that also being said, I think another strength for, for Georgia um, and working on climate change is communications. I think we do a phenomenal job in communicating amongst our partners. We do that at our um, regional level on the coast and then through the Georgia Climate Project, we're able to expand that and do that statewide. So we know what each other is working on. Obviously, coastal Georgia has very different issues as climate changes, climate change um, becomes a topic for us or is a topic for us and very different from Atlanta, the Atlanta area or the West Georgia area. And so being able to have the, the Georgia Climate Project help us to bridge all of that together, I think is a huge strength for Georgia. Um, some of the things that I have seen um, our, our coastal communities working on is including zoning um, changes and um, ordinance changes and changes that address sea level rise. I will say that you'll, you, you've probably heard mostly about sea level rise today, and that's because that is definitely something that we see um, that's very tangible that we see here on the coast with, with high tide flooding. And I think that um, it's very, it makes it easier for us to talk about this with our, our coastal communities. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of the work that is being done is centered around sea level rise planning. Um, infrastructure planning, we do have some communities who are looking at um, their vulnerable infrastructure and vulnerabilities to, you know, well, let's talk about the different types of flooding, vulnerabilities to storm surge, storm surge, um, and increased storm surge, um, high tide flooding or sunny day flooding, um, also to sea level rise, and then just an increase in precipitation for coastal Georgia. And so it's not, it's a multitude of types of flooding that, that these communities are looking at. Um, and then, you know, how do they, how do they better um, plan for the infrastructure. Um, I can I can tell you that um, I know that one of the questions that was asked to Scott is is how do you do this or what's the biggest obstacle and it is 100% funding. Um, you really have to start that capital improvement funding now for being able to make those um, infrastructure upgrades to be able to adapt to to, to sea level rise. Um, a lot of the information that we have for planning is on a, um, can be built out to a 30 year horizon. Um, and that is the life expectancy of a lot of infrastructure. So that really is a good fit for communities to, to start thinking in those needs. Um, resiliency networks, uh, we, there, there is one just up the road from us, the Charleston Resiliency Network, which we have um, a couple of our communities here in coastal Georgia that are looking to, um, somewhat um, adapt their own resiliency network to, which is really exciting. Um, we're gonna be looking to um, Chatham County and the city of Savannah to take the reins in that for coastal Georgia. Um, hazard mitigation and comprehensive plans. This is really key. Um, we, you can't just have a standalone plan and expect your, you know, your, your community to um, just use that for sea level rise planning. It, it really is effective if it's incorporated into all of the plans that they are already required to have and to go to and look at. Um, each coastal Georgia community has a hazard mitigation plan. That hazard mitigation plan is required to be updated every five years. And to in, they're just now at the point where um, the emergency management agencies are very accept, accepting of including sea level rise into that. Um, in the past, it was kind of um, looked at as not acceptable because they weren't considering sea level rise as being an e hazardous event. And now they are, yeah, let's go ahead and 
let's put it in there. And, and most of our coastal communities, um, if they haven't already, are looking at adding it moving forward. Um, comprehensive plans. All of our coastal local governments have to have a comprehensive plan in order to be um, a qualified local government eligible for funds, um, including sea level rise and um, climate change impacts into their local comprehensive plans is also um, a, a huge step that we are encouraging them to take. Um, all of our um, 11 coastal counties by the end of, um, by, by spring, by the next spring, will have disaster recovery and redevelopment plans. Um, all of those plans have required their communities to do um, capacity assessments, including climate change capacity um, planning. Um, our six coastal counties have also been um, required to look at sea level rise when redeveloping their community if need be. They're also um, asked, required to look at shoreline change rates for their areas. So erosion, sedimentation. Um, and so those are all, all included in those plans. Um, the really cool thing about this as well is that back um, April of 2019, um, Governor Kemp signed the state's hazard, adopted the state's hazard mitigation plan which also included climate change impacts and sea level rise. So at the state level, it is also now included, which um, is pretty excited. Um, Just, we have about 30 seconds left. Okay, um, creation of resources and tools. We have our local governments um, creating their own resources and tools to be able to help um, get the information out to the public and then utilize that information um, themselves as well. Um, one of the, the biggest highlights that I think for coastal Georgia is, you know, we don't, we aren't a state that has climate change policy rules or regulations, but we have done an awful lot um, in our communities. Our local governments have incorporated a lot. They've um, adopted a lot of zoning ordinances and zoning and themselves which I think is just, it says a lot for um, the, the, the knowledge that is there um, and knowing that this is really important. Um, the gaps and the challenges, um, we do need to look better at planning for our socially vulnerable populations. Um, I am a physical scientist, so we, this is where we really need to add that social science um, and physical science together. Um, Local governments have a lot on their plates. Climate change and sea level rise is not gonna be at the top, not gonna be their number one priority. Um, so it, sometimes it's gonna be difficult to get this on their radar. Uh, we don't have a lot of information on our marine fisheries impacts and our um, tourism impacts. So I think that those are obviously gonna be issues that, that need to be addressed. And one last shameless plug. Um, one other thing that we have done really, really well is the state of Georgia is um, preparing to host its third climate conference, which is to me also another um, accomplishment for our state. It is going to be um, April 28th and 29th on Jekyll Island. Um, the website is up here on my screen. Um, take a look at it. Registration will open January 1st. Um, and we're really excited to take this opportunity to highlight um, more of the projects that are going on around Georgia and our surrounding area and how we can, um, you know, partner and benefit from, from more of that. So with that, I'll end. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. It's good to hear all the good work going on on our coast um, to adapt to the changes of, uh, and impacts of climate change. So thanks for the overview. Uh, we do have um, a question here. Uh, let's see. One is, uh, what one thing would you like to see implemented in coastal Georgia to make it more resilient to climate change? You know, I, I think um, it may sound a little bit um, cliche, but we, we don't do a really good, I mean, we have numerous partners and we all do have our kind of our specialty area we don't have one specific entity that focuses on just general public education. Um, I would like to see somehow that implemented um, a little bit better. 
Um, we do a great job with our, um, I feel like our elected officials, our local governments, um, our researchers are steadily working away, but just general public education, we, we don't do a great job of. Another question, Jennifer, um, that came in the chat box says, in terms of access to funding, there are millions of dollars available in federal disaster mitigation and resiliency funds through grant programs like HUD's community, the CDBG mitigation grants, as well as FEMA's um, new BRIC program. Does Coastal Georgia plan to utilize these funds? And if so, how? Absolutely. <laughs> um, we. we we are, so we've been working with our state um, Department of Community Affairs on the CDBG DR funds that have been coming in and the MIT funds um, and ensuring that a lot of those projects will um, look at and address resiliency to sea level rise specifically and climate change impacts. Um, as I was mentioning the disaster recovery and redevelopment plans that we've been doing here in coastal Georgia some of that CDBG DR funds will also be allocated over to West Georgia for Hurricane um, Michael, and they will be doing the same disaster recovery and redevelopment planning um, over there as well. We also um, will be looking at some of the, the BRIC funds. Obviously, that is a brand new pot of money. Um, and so how that's going to be um, implemented, I, I think, is still a little bit left to be um, questioned. However, I will say because the governor did sign that um, hazard mitigation plan back in 2019 that does include sea level rise and climate change, that it opens our state up to being able to apply for funds that seek um, to be more resilient to sea level rise because it's included in our statewide plan. So that's a huge benefit for Georgia. Great, thanks Jennifer. Um, so at this point we're in the, the Q, we have some time for Q&A with all of our panelists. So great job everyone. Um, wonderful overview of climate impacts here on our Georgia coast. So let's bring everybody back um, on video and please keep those questions coming in to the Q&A box. Um, and I will hit some of those or ask some of those questions that came in earlier as well. So we'll go ahead and um, and jump to that. I think uh, we've got one question that came in just after Joel's talk. Um, Joel, are you on camera here? Yeah, there we go. Um, Joel, this is from Dr. Clark Alexander saying, what do you do to protect your home when a low lying living shoreline won't protect from the forces impacting the shore like at Taylor Swift's house? <laughs> Thanks for the tough question, Clark. So um, my, I give that example to, to highlight awareness that we want people to be aware of the use of green infrastructure along with hardened shorelines. And I think that's a better question for the engineers. Maybe Scott can answer better or, or Jennifer, what are some options for people like that? I mean, it's a dramatic example and you can see there's not much shoreline in front of her house uh, to be engineered, you know? So I'm not sure that a natural or nature-based infrastructure would be the answer there. I mean, you could certainly look into whether uh, natural infrastructure could be, uh, you know, whether that that hard, you know, you could combine uh, 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 physical uh, structures with with a, a, a living shoreline. But maybe some engineers can give you better suggestions on that. I mean, we're co we're we're coming to a, a point now with with sea level rise where just deciding whether you're going to uh, build or occupy a house in an area like that that's so close to an area that's going to be inundated is a good idea. So my point is that, you know, by, by, you know, Taylor Swift has a lot of money, so it's not such an important issue for her, right? But for other homeowners that don't have so, so much money or for coastal municipalities that don't have so much money, they might want to think twice about uh, building in, in those areas and considering uh, the long-term planning that Scott and Jennifer were, were talking about uh, before they just uh, throw a bunch of rocks down and build a seawall. So that's really my point uh, for, with this dramatic example. Anything else from the other panelists? Thank you, Joel. I, I will say that I think at some point in time, um, the, the communities are gonna have to look at retreat policies because of those issues. Um, right now, no, no local, <laughs> no community in our state um, is really um, hindering that way. But I think that at some point in time, we will meet that threshold where 
um, especially after disasters, you're going to have to figure out where um, where we want, where we will retreat. And so I think that um, I think that, that that's something that our communities will have to start to address. All right, um, we've got another question here that came in from Elizabeth Hunter. I think this was um, after your talk, Mr. Shibaka. Um, the question is, are there any efforts to look at the intersection between where there is currently failing infrastructure and infrastructure that will fail due to sea level rise on Georgia's coast and socioeconomic status of community? And I welcome others to answer this as well as Mr. Shibaka. Yes, we, uh, that's being looked at now. There are some <clears throat> uh, there are some construction and building changes that are happening off of West Bay Street, and of course we have the uh, construction of the Savannah Arena um, <clears throat> off of uh, Louisville, and the issues of of how how to proceed with regards to sea level rise uh, are, are, being, uh, are, are being considered. Um, my understanding is that the uh, Chatham County Emergency Management uh, Agency is also looking at methods of mitigation uh, along the, the coast, but then also up through the, the area of the port and what improvements can be made to uh, 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 to deal with the uh, effects of, of sea level rise in, in that area. That's the that's the level of understanding I have. Um, and uh, you know, uh, if anyone else has more information, that that um, you know that, that that would be helpful to know. Um, I, I would add that at, at a larger scale, there are, there are efforts underway from a number of different sources to um, kind of map the socioeconomic status of people who are in areas that are generally vulnerable to sea level rise and flooding. Um, do a lot of things that are called like social vulnerability indices, where they marry the census data to some of the um, the, the threat hazard data. Um, and then as we go forward with projects like the one I referenced in Bryan County, where we're mapping the actual um, infrastructure impact. We are um, trying to use those same sort of indices and then also doing on the ground surveys and stuff to evaluate the socioeconomic status and the um, types of vulnerabilities of the populations who are affected. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Shibaka. Any other contributions to that question? A good question. Thank you. Um, Another question came in, uh, Jennifer, this is um, pertaining to your talk uh, from Kim Cobb saying, you rightly call out uh, more for more public education and awareness. Are there specific efforts that involve K through 12 education if you think that's a priority? I mean, I think that, um, yes, I, I mean, yes, I think K through 12 is obviously an important um, um, demographic that we need to reach and um, get the information to K through 12. I think that um, <laughs> their parents is important and we definitely do. Um, I mean, understanding climate change in general is, is a very difficult concept to explain, especially when we keep changing the, the name of it. Um, and so I think just explaining some of the, the, the cons explaining some of the science to the general public, um, to the voters, they need to be able to understand what what it, what it is in general, and then they can be better able to understand what some of the risks are that we're facing. Um, and I think we just, we don't have a specific sector who um, who is specializing in that. Great, thanks Jennifer. Um, this is a question, I think, for anyone on the panel. Uh, how do we incorporate coastal historic resources in communities, for instance, like Port, Port Pulaski and the Pinpoint community, into climate mitigation and adaptation plans? Do we need to consider allocating funding towards relocation? Anyone like to take a stab at that? I can say from my experience, we, we definitely include um, historical 
um, resources when we do disaster recovery and redevelopment planning. Um, and as that does relate to, to sea level rise and climate change impacts, um, I think that it would be wonderful if there was a magic pot of money to, um, to relocate some of those critical historical and cultural um, assets. Um, I, to this, to, as of right now, I don't know where that um, pot of money would exist. So I think that um, it's definitely something to take into consideration. Yeah, and I'd, uh, I'd add that, yeah, in, in thinking about historic resources generally, um, I think it's something the communities need to plan for and make individual decisions about in the sense of how do you preserve the historical integrity of the sites and of the buildings in question and also adapt them, like what sorts of infrastructure um, changes can be implemented that will protect them and at the same time preserve some of that integrity that, that, that people value about it. And in terms of things like Port Pulaski in particular, I know the um, like the National Park Service is investing in things like living shorelines and exploring other means to protect it in sight. Um, but it's one of those questions of if you spend a bunch of money relocated, does it have the same significance in another location or does it need to stay where it is to mean anything at all? And I think that's a, you know, a long-term planning question that has to be sort of taken on a case-by-case -case basis of what's important, why is it important, and can we protect it, can we move it, what do we need to do? Um, Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer and Scott. Um, we have another question here that's for any of our panelists. Um, are there specific state policy changes you would like to see that would have a positive impact on coastal climate adaptation in Georgia? Any, any input there? I know that many of our, our panelists are government, state and government employees. So perhaps, um, you know, that's why the, the quiet answer, but if there's any thoughts there, um, just general recommendations or things that you know are moving forward. In this. I, I would say um, throw out more support and funding for CRD and all the efforts that, that they're doing and, and that Jennifer's up to. Um, I think they've, they've had a tremendous impact already and with more support and more resources, they could do a lot more. Um, so that's something I'd like to see. I would agree with that. I, I do know also that there are a couple of um, representatives um, up in the uh, Lawrenceville and coastal area that have been supporting a, a bill to support a, um, a, a climate change um, like expertise panel to move forward. Um, and I'm not sure if that will be put back in um, come January. Um, I know that that had made a little bit of traction just to kind of help, I think, educate, um, educate some of the legislative committees on, you know, the research and, you know, what, what's going on. So I, I know that it's definitely out there. Right. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, I think that's a good question to end on. We do only have a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to say thank you all to, um, to all the panelists for your excellent presentation and overview of climate impacts here in coastal Georgia, as well as to the participants for their excellent engagement and questions. Um, I think it's been a really interesting and um, informative hour and a half. So thanks everyone for organizing. And now I'll turn it over to Rachel for a few closing comments. Awesome. Thanks again, Ashby, for helping us to moderate today. I want to respect everyone's time and make sure that we get you out of here on time. But thank you again to everyone who is able to attend today. We did get a few comments in the chat that were like, I have to leave. Is there going to be a recording? Yes, we're going to be working on a recording that will be going up on, on the Georgia Climate Project website. So please stay posted for that update and share it with anyone who wasn't able to attend today. And also just like a huge round of applause to all of our amazing panelists and moderators. Thank you so much um, for coming and sharing your expertise and knowledge and taking the time. Thank you to everyone who was able to attend. This was such a meaningful and fruitful conversation. Just to plug it one more time, we do have more webinars coming up in the future um, with October being human health, November being ecosystems and December being water resources. So be sure to follow us on social media and you won't miss any of those updates as well. 
Um, just a quick reminder that when you close out of this Zoom webinar, you should get a pop-up link to fill out an evaluation. If now is not a good time, we'll also include that link in a follow-up email. So please let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Um, and thank you again, everyone. We really appreciate you coming today.